Brother Joe is, he's in Belize and have just completed the Belize Pastor Conference and wanted me to let you know that it went exceptionally well. It was a great conference and uh, he wanted me to let you know that all the pastors send their love and their gratitude to you because you made that possible through your gifts to make the pastor's retreat a reality. So they want to thank you personally, those pastors do, for how you bless the Belizean people during that conference and how those blessings will continue to bless those Belizean uh, pastors. And I know uh, Brother Joe is grateful to you for the prayers for that. And I know he's grateful to you for the prayers for Sister Kathy that she's doing better. And I know that kind of freed his mind to know she was doing better and uh, to even be here this morning. And so thank you for those prayers. Uh, and he'll, I know, give us a report on that conference next Sunday of some more details, and you don't want to miss that as well. Well, this morning I wanted to share with you about a manager of a minor league baseball team. Uh, this guy was, this manager was so frustrated with his center fielder that he called his center fielder into the dugout. I mean, he waved him in. And the center fielder, right in the game, they stopped the game, center fielder comes to the dugout, and the manager just grabs him by the neck and says, man, you are a lousy center fielder. You can't catch. You can't do anything. I'm, and he sat him down there on the bench. He said, you're just benched right now. And he said, I'm going to go out there. The manager said, I'm going out there. I'll show you how to play center field. So the manager, of course, they wear uniforms. You know, the coach is doing baseball, so he runs out there. Man, first ball, hits a grounder, bounces back up, and knocks his tooth out. The next ball, he loses in the sun and hits him right on the nose and breaks his nose. Third ball comes line drive, goes right over his glove and hits his eye. About puts his eye out and swells up. Manager runs back in the dugout, grabs that center fielder by the neck, ra raises him up and said, You big dummy, you done messed up center field so bad, I can't even play it. <laughs> You know, but that's where we do. We blame everybody and everything and every circumstances on why we're not move, mo, moving on with the Lord and why we're not where we're supposed to be and why we've done what we've done spiritually and why haven't we grown. And all these things we do like that manager. We blame somebody else. But, you know, we really can't blame anybody else but us because the issue relies on us. And I know this quick question here, the title of this message, Whose Slave Are You?, is the answer to why those things happen. And the answer to why we give those answers is whose slave are you? Now, I know you're, some of you are out there going, well, Brother Tim, I'm nobody's slave. <laughs> I live my own life and I'm not a master to nothing. Well, that's not really true according to the Scripture because we're looking at one verse this morning in Romans 6, 16. Do you not know? In other words, you better understand this is what he's saying. When he says, when Paul says, do you not know? It's, it's a really emphatic. You need to know this. This is imperative. That when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. See, those are the two choices that we face. And in order to really believe this verse, and I know it, as a matter of fact, I read one commentary on there. He says, to some people, this verse is offensive. It's offensive. Because a lot of people say, look, I'm not a slave to anybody. And don't call me a slave. Don't, I don't want to be treated like a slave and, and all these things. Well, we have to accept this verse, like we really do almost all other verses, by faith. See, this morning, if I told everybody that while y'all were in here, I came a little earlier from the other campus and I put a little bit of baggie with $1,000 taped to every single vehicle in the parking lot. And inside that, there's an incendiary device that will, uh, after I finish making this statement, that will destroy that package and that money in 10 minutes after I stop telling you about this, it'll start. Now, if I said that to everybody, there would really be four responses. First of all, most of you would say, I don't believe that's true. First of all, where he's going to get that kind of money? Uh, why would he risk us maybe even burning a little bit of our car when this thing kind of melts away? Uh, you know, be all these questions. He said, I think Brother Tim's just joking with us, so it's not true. 
other people would say, you know what, I believe some of that may be true. You know, maybe the part about the money, but it's probably going to be less. And the 10 minutes is probably not going to be 10 minutes. It's probably whenever we want to get out there, it'll be there for us. So that's some people's response. Some people, their response would be even different. Their response would be, you know what, I believe it. And then you never run out there within 10 minutes. That's where a lot of people say, I believe the Bible, I believe that, but they don't know anything about it. And the fourth response would be, some people, when I finish, you'd run over your neighbor and step on them so that you could get out there in 10 minutes to get your $1,000 off the car. Now, only the last response is faith. Faith is not saying I don't believe it. Faith is not saying I believe it, but here's where the parts I believe are true. Faith is saying it is so, and I'm acting as if it's so, and I'm doing it just like it says to do it. Now, that's how you have to believe the Bible. You have to look at this verse and say, even though it cuts against the grain of my flesh, even though it cuts against the grain of my mind, I know it's true that I am going to be a slave to something, period. And so the question this morning is, whose slave are we? Who, who, which one are we going to obey? Now, the slavery was a little different back in Jesus' day than it was uh, what we know in America what happened. Now, obviously, it's neither one are good and right, but in Jesus' day, there was not as so much abuse and beatings and all that as there was uh, that we know of. Now, obviously, nobody wanted to be a slave, but many of the slaves, the main issue was not the abuse. The main issue was ownership. They were not owned by themselves. They were owned by somebody else, and this tells us that we are such as well. So let's look at, first of all, the fact. The fact says that we are the slaves of the one who we obey. So the fact is we're all slaves. And there, there is no neutral ground. A lot of people say, well, I'm not a slave to sin and self. That's the one option. I'm a slave to doing what I want to do. And I'm not a slave uh, to the Lord I'm, I'm kind of a man that's my own man, my own woman. I, I just make my own choices and whatever. Well, the Bible doesn't give that neutral ground. The, the, it doesn't give that option. So by faith, I say, Lord, I know I'm a slave to something. Either I'm a slave and I'm enslaved to the obedience of sin or I'm enslaved to the obedience of you. So that's where a lot of people, they want their Christian life down the middle and they say, well, I'm not a slave to anything. Well, that's not true. We, we get torn into that pattern. And that pattern always leads to wrong, to death. I guess this thing, you don't have to hit it, it's doing what it did before. It's using, pull, pulling them all up. The next thing is the fortress. The fortress is, in Romans 6, 16, either sin resulting in death. That's the option. That's the fortress. That, that's, that's the bondage we find ourselves into. If we don't go with the option of being slaves to God, we go with the option of being sa slaves to self, and that only results in death. Not only spiritual death, physical death, but I believe even for the Christian who goes back to being a slave to sin, death of all your desires, death of happiness, death of joy, all those things are not going to be in your life if you're a slave to self and a slave to sin. You can see them up there. It says, why are we slaves? Why, why do we stay in bondage? Well, there's really four reasons. One, we don't know we're in bondage. A lot of people simply don't know. They don't know this verse. They haven't accepted this verse because we're in bondage to whoever or whatever we obey, whether it's self or whether it's the Lord. The second one is we know we're in bondage, but we don't know how to get out. In other words, Brother Tim, there's these things in my life that I know still, whether you're saved or lost. If you're, if you're lost, you're in bondage to sin because you've never been set free at all. But if you're saved this morning and there's some still things in your life that you haven't got free of and there's still bondage in your life that you say, I've never been able to change in this area. This is a constant hold in my life. Maybe you just say, hey, I, I, uh, I just don't know how to get out. The third one is, we know we're in bondage, but it, we like it too much to escape. A lot of people just simply, whether they're lost or saved, they enjoy their sin. They enjoy living for themselves. They enjoy the selfish life. They enjoy running the show. And so they're not going to uh, change. They're going to keep it just the way they are. They just decorate their cell. They 
take their prison cell and they put pictures up and some curtains and some nice flowers and they say, okay, this is my cell and I'm just going to enjoy the rest of my life in this prison cell. And the last one is we escaped before, but now we're back. In other words, we tried this before. Whatever this habit, sin, stronghold, fault, thing that you just can't overcome, you've already come to the conclusion, it's just me. It's just how I am. And I keep going back to it and keep going back to it and keep going back to it. And so you said, I've tried before and I, I can't escape. I'm just enslaved to this behavior. I'm enslaved to this trait. I'm enslaved to this action. I'm enslaved to this person. I'm enslaved to whatever it is that you just can't overcome. You've been praying about it. You've been seeking the Lord to become whatever it is God wants you to become, but you can't get there because you feel like you're in bondage. You can't escape. You know, you may have heard about circus elephants and how circus elephants those monster sized elephants they're at the circus and you see them outside the tent and they're they're being attached with a rope and the rope is attached to a, a peg that's driven in the ground you think man that's a massive elephant to be kept with one peg I mean gosh what if he escaped he could trample and kill people well yes that peg in that ground is like a toothpick in the ground to us if I tied you up to a rope and put a toothpick in the ground, I said, that's going to keep you here. That's what that is to that elephant. He could yank it up with no effort at all and trample people. You say, well, why does he stay tied up like that? Well, it's because circus elephants, they get them at a very young age. And they get them and they tie them up with the exact same rope and the exact same peg. And that little elephant tugs and he yanks and he pulls and he tugs and he yanks and he pulls. And he, being as small as he is, cannot pull that peg up. He's just too small. And he tries that and he tries that, well, after several months or maybe even a year, he just gives up. He said, man, they got me, they got me good here. I'm never going to be able to escape. Well, then he, when he becomes a massive, large elephant, a mature elephant, guess what he does? He never tries because he's convinced the way he was raised, the way he was as a kid, the way he developed, his circumstances, his abuse, whatever it was while he was a kid, all that growing up, this is simply the way he is. And this chain and this bondage and this inability to escape is just going to be there because he's tried before. You see, we are who we are beside for Christ how we've been raised and our experiences or whatever, it's Christ that makes the difference. It's Christ that can overcome all of that. There is nothing you, you have been through, how you were raised, how you were brought up, and all your experiences that Christ can't change dramatically. But if you don't allow him, then you're simply saying, I'm stuck this way because this is the way I've always been and I was raised this way and I was abused this way and I went through this and it'll never change. We're enslaved and saying we'll never change get free. And the Lord all alone saying, hey, you can't do it, but if you'll be a slave to me, I'll free you. <laughs> See, it's not that freedom's not the goal. Freedom can only come from enslavement to Christ. If you think you can get freedom any other way, it's just not there. It just cannot be obtained. Now, the next one is the freedom. See, now that was the fortress but the freedom is later in that verse, or obedience. A slave to obedience resulting in what? Righteousness. The righteousness of Christ is ours. You see, before when you were in the fortress and I was in the fortress in salvation, we had no choice. We were slaves to sin. You say, well, you did have a choice. Only if you came to Christ. See, we were slaves to sin. Our, our choices were this. Here was our choices. Not if we were going to sin, how we're going to sin, when we're going to sin, where we're going to sin, and to what greed we're going to sin. Those were our four choices. It was never if. It was how and when and where. Why? Because we're enslaved to sin. If we don't believe that, that's what the Bible says we were when we were lost. We were just doing what we're enslaved to do. Now, when we got saved, when we received Christ as our Savior, then He freed us from that slavery, and then for once in our life we could experience True righteousness. His righteousness, but it worked out through daily righteousness where we could live. From, now, we still will sin some, 
but we're not slaves to sin anymore. We may fall into sin occasionally. We may stumble in sin, but we're going to get up because why? We're free people. We've been free in Christ because of what Christ did on the cross. We have liberty, and now we can go to a different slavery, which is really the free slavery. That sounds like an oxymoron, but it is. It's, it's the true sense of the word that I become a slave to Christ. How do we get and stay free? That's what we all want. We want true freedom. We want liberty. We don't want to be in bondage to any type of sin or behavior. So how do we get there? Well, Jesus told us this way. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's it right there. All locked up in that one verse. You want to be free this morning? That's the verse. The truth will set you free. You know, I had this hydraulic kind of little device that I could not get to work. And I tried different places to see if they had a rebuild kit, and they didn't, and I was too cheap to buy a new one. And so I said, I'm going to fix this thing one way or another. And so nobody had it. I got on eBay, and I found this guy. I guess he made them himself. He made a rebuild kit. You know, and so I ordered it, you know, real cheap, and got it and put it all together. And I was amazed it all went back together, but it wouldn't work. And I don't know why, just this thing just got in my, my mind. I was thinking about it, and I'd be like at night thinking, how can I fix this? And I'd, I'd get on the internet and see people's advice on what to do and how to do this and that. And I tried and tried and tried. And each weekend, I'd say, I'm going to fix it this weekend. And I'd work on it a little bit more. And I started to think of the hours I'd put. I said, I could have got a second job and bought the part. You know, I mean, I was just, it was just driving me nuts. Is that this is not working out right. And I just, it just was a mental battle for me that I had to conquer to, or this thing was going to conquer me. So I said, you know, I think the guy had a little slip of paper in the little rebuild kit, and I pulled it out, and he said, I mean, the guy himself said, if you've got any questions or concerns or whatever, please email me at whatever. I said, buddy, you get an email. So I emailed him. I said, man, this thing's not working out right. I rebuilt it, I think, right, and whatever. So he emails me back this long list. He numbered them. One, do, I mean, because I told him, I said, you're talking about an amateur here. Please don't go over my head. Give me the, and he went, one, do this. Two, now do this. Three, do this. Four, do this. He went through about 10 things, and I, I copied that off. I laid it on my workbench, and I wasn't going to miss a one because I was so frustrated. I was going to do it right. One, and I did it this. Two, I went through his whole list. I got through. It worked. I mean, I emailed him back. I said, you are so smart. You are just so smart. <laughs> And now I didn't have anything to worry about, thought about, well, not in regard to that. You know, I was just, the truth set me free. That's all I needed was the truth. It was out there all along. All I had to do was go to the manufacturer. These things, you know, these scriptures are numbered too, you know, just one to three. And read what the manufacturer of the rebuild kit said. Do it this way. And the truth set me free. Didn't have to say this thing's done. If I have to worry about something, it's going to have to be something else because this is already a done deal. It's fixed. See, that's what the word means there. If you never realize what that scripture meant, that's what it meant. If you're struggling, if you're going through anything, check out the truth, do it, and it sets you free. And there's no experience like freedom. It's the greatest feeling to be free and not have to worry about any kind of bondage mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever the case may be, or even a sin that has you grabbed, you can be set free with the truth. And I believe there's three truths that we have to catch, we have to adhere to, we have to hold on to if we're going to really be true and free and slaves to Christ versus slaves to ourselves and our sin and our desires because we all want to be free. First of all, is true freedom is not absence of boundaries or restrictions. That's what people, most people would say that that's what freedom is. All things, Paul said, are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Paul says, I have a lot of decisions, and some decisions aren't necessarily wrong, but they're not profitable. So many people look at life this way. 
I wonder if I ought to do that. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Or what's so wrong with that? Don't ask that question. Ask, so what's right, what's so right about that? How is this going to be beneficial to me? How is this going to be, as Paul said, will this be profitable for me? See, we look at how we can get away with everything. Why, we want the most freedom possible. I bet I can go all the way to the line on that. I bet the Lord would be okay if I dabble over here or I flirt over here or I pull steel just a little over here or I watch just a little more of that and we're seeing what we can get away with instead of being what's most what? Profitable. Why? Because freedom in Christ still has boundaries and restrictions. Say, I don't believe that. Well, look at America. What is America? The land of the free, the home of the brave, the Liberty Bell, the Statue of Liberty. That's what we are. We're freedom. Come here to America. Why? Because we're free. That's why people come from all over the world to come to these shores to say, I want what you have because you have freedom. Do we? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to get out here when I leave and I'm going to go ahead and travel 100 miles an hour down the freeway because I am free. And I'm going to tell that police officer, I am in America. And I am free. He said, well, this ticket ain't going to be free, but you're free to sign right there. You, know, you do whatever you want, but you're not free. I have restrictions, yes. Speed limits, stop sign, taxes, laws, regulations, restrictions, regulations but I'm still in the most free country in the world, but I still have restrictions. Every sports has restrictions, rules, boundaries, out of bounds. Why? Because a country runs best with restrictions and rules. A sport event runs best with restrictions and rules. We were at Galveston for that retreat, that leader retreat, and, and looking out there in the ocean, you had people on this side walking, and you, I noticed you, you, you had fish out in the water. What if some fish decided, you know what? I'm sick and tired of living in this water. I want to be free. And so he decides, I'm just going to go ahead and live on land. So he pops out of the water and gets up there on the beach. And he said, all these people are lounging and suntanning. So I'm going to go ahead and enjoy a little bit of freedom in life. And so he lays out there and gets a little suntan. Well, eventually, he's going to start acting kind of strange. He's going to be flipping and flopping and he's going to and he can't breathe. Why, he was never intended to live out of the restriction of which God placed him. So he has to be restricted. He can only live a certain amount of time out of the environment that God created him to live in. And same way with us, unless we have some scuba equipment, we can only stay in water, even with that equipment, for a limited amount of time because our bodies were never designed to live in their envi environment for a long period of time. God placed restrictions on us so that we know that we have true freedom. So if you're looking for life without restrictions as true freedom, you're barking up the wrong tree. You'll be like the guy that says, I want true freedom. I hate my parents doing this. My boss is telling me what to do. Government's telling me what to do. I'm going to join the military. <laughs> you know, you cannot get out of restrictions. It's not out there. And young people, it doesn't exist. You always have to have, to have true freedom, you have to have boundaries and restrictions. And then you can enjoy the freedom within the restrictions that God gives us. Now, the second thing is true freedom involves staying away from what I call our influence captors. Because there are things, they're either the sin itself and you get so close to it, you fall into the sin. You've got to get a long way away from it or those people who wrongly influence you to do that sin or shortcoming. Romans says, but, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Make no provision. Don't even get close to it. Stay away from those influences. Stay away from the, that sin as far as you can. In other words, if you want to have true freedom, back off from it. Yes, you need the Lord's help, but you need to 
put up some restrictions of your own. You say, that might not be a restriction for somebody, but when I look at that, go there, do this, then I fall into that sin, and I'm not even gonna make a provision for it. Because I know every time I do that, I fall into sin, and I'm not gonna allow that in my life. You ever saw where somebody escaped from the plantation in the slave trade era, and they ran from the plantation? Do you think they would have ran from the plantation and built a house right next door to it? No. Those slaves would get as far away from that plantation as possible looking for a free state. But you know, that's not how Christians do. Here's what I can't do, and I'm going to build my house as close to it as I can. And we wonder why we're still in bondage. Because you, you need to be like that slave and get away from your captors as far as you can. And also influences. We need to watch what people influence us and have an influence on us. I mentioned this at the lift leader retreat because we were talking about Rehoboam there, about this king. He was, he was Solomon's son. He was David's grandson. He was about to be made king and the people came to King Rehoboam and they said, look, your father was too hard on us. He taxed us too much. He, he had too much. We had to labor too much with all these taxes. It was too much of a burden. And if you'll lighten this burden, you'll lighten these taxes for us. We'll serve you forever. We'll be there for you. We'll back you up. We'll, 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 you'll just, we'll, we'll be there to serve you if you'll just serve us in this little way by doing this. So he, King Rehoboam, young guy, says, hey, uh, give me about three days. So he goes to the elders. Those were probably the people his dad's age, the elders. And he asked the elders, what do y'all think I ought to do? And he said, do that. Let, let them have what they want. Lower the taxes, lower that burden, and these people will serve you forever. Do what they ask in this situation, and you'll be glad you did, basically. But this young guy, he decides after he finishes talking with the elders, he goes to talk with the homeboys. The boys his age, the teenage boys, the, the boys that are of his same caliber and his same maturity, or should I say immaturity. I could see them with their little tunics down below their waistline, with their little, <laughs> with their little turbans kicked sideways, you know, and with the little antique boombox, you know. I mean, these, these are the guys he, they go to and said, what do you think we ought to do? Well, these whole boys say, make it worse. You're going to be king. That's kind of what they were saying. Tax them more. Do more to them. Man, make them really suffer. I mean, that was the general idea. You, you not only do what your dad did, do worse. And you know who he went with? He went with the homeboys instead of the elders. He let the wrong people influence him. And if you want to know in your church history what event tore the kingdom of Israel in two, to two tribes and ten, that was the event. Because right after that, it gets ripped in two. I said, okay, we're mad now. You didn't do what we said, and now you have two tribes and ten tribes of Israel. Because one youngster took the wrong advice. And young people, you make sure you get the right advice because a lot of people go to college and they look at those people and those professors and they said, those people are smart and they're smarter than my church and they're smarter than my parents and they say there's no God and I'm going with them. And you see people today, young people who are backing away from God once they've been to college because they say if a smart professor does it, then he knows better than everybody else. Listen, you can have a PhD in foolishness. And the higher you advance, sometimes you can see it. I'm not saying all of them, but you have to be on guard because they want to sway you away from God. Amen. It's your influence, your captors. And then later on, you'll say, man, those guys were wrong if they lead me away from being a slave to Christ because that's the only way I can have true freedom. You know, scientists, one scientist put a pot plant and he put a caterpillar's favorite plant in the middle. And he lined up the caterpillars where it was solid caterpillars, one right behind the other one, so that all they could see was the caterpillar in front of them. And they started marching around the lip of the plant, and I mean, the lip of the pot. The plant was right there. All they had to do was jump off, go over and eat something. But you know, those caterpillars went around and around following each other till they died of starvation. All they were doing was following the person in front, well, not person, caterpillar in front of them. 
And that's what we've done here in America. That's success. That movie star, that rich person, and we're following everybody around in circle and starving from the Word of God, which is right there, and all we do is follow the person in front of us from wrong influence and what I call influence captors. We have to, that's what the church is about. One of the greatest things that helped me as a young Christian was finally getting a Christian friend. Well, that's a brilliant idea. I mean, I'm thinking, why didn't I think of this before, you know? I was hanging around with the guys that we had fun with, but there was no spirituality, and, and I'm not blaming them, but I just went with what they were doing. Instead of having somebody that could hold me accountable and for the first time and say, you're wrong. Never had a friend ever say that. Boy, you mean I mean, it took me a little while to get used to that, but that was what I needed, was the accountability and the friendship of a close Christian uh, person. And, and that influence helps in your freedom to stay free. Yes, we're free in Christ, but we have to walk in freedom. And then the last one or is true freedom involves going to and submitting to the one with the key. God has the key. He unlocks the jail. He unlocks the cell. And the first thing you have to remove is the here's the way I see it chains. If you don't remove that chain, you'll never be free. Because the way I see it's immaterial. It's the way God sees it. See, I'm in so much bondage, I want this thing to say what I want it to say instead of what it says. Because if I don't do what it says, I have to do that. Why? I feel guilty if I don't. If I say, that's what it says and I'm not going to do it, that brings guilt. But if I say, that's what it says, but here's the way I see it, then I feel okay. No, you're back in bondage. So you can't make it say what you want to say. That's why Proverbs says, there's a way which seems right to a man, but the end of his death. I mean, it seems right to me. Well, it's not right to you or wrong to you. It's what's right or wrong to the Lord. And you can see in, in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll make your path straight. Submit to slavery to Him and He's going to direct your path. He's going to lead you to whatever you need, whatever it is that God's created you for and bring you ultimate fulfillment. See, we want freedom we just don't know how to get there because we get there with our own understanding. See, we'll never make that. If we lean on our own understanding, we never get true freedom and true blessing. You know, there's a lot of things I like about home ownership. But one thing, one thing, it's probably the only thing, that I enjoyed about apartment life was when anything broke. Come fix it, it's broke. <laughs> that was so easy. Something else is broke. Come fix it. That was just, just it just made, do you think I do that at home? <laughs> no, this breaks. Oh, get out the tools, fix it. This breaks. Why? I can't call anybody. Brother Tim, watch Kenji call anybody. Because now I'm the owner. I'm the owner. But back then, the apartment complex owned it. And since they owned it, they have a contract that if anything goes wrong, they will fix it. I don't know if you follow me here, but you call the Lord in prayer. Dring, dring. Lord, it's me. I'm having some difficulty in my life. Could you please fix it? And you've been acting like the owner? Woo-hoo! Uh-oh. Wonder why them prayers ain't been answered. Maybe the Lord's saying to you, you've been owning it. Welcome to the ownership world. Hmm? If you own it, Aren't you responsible? But if I'm a slave to Christ and he owns me and I act as if he owns me, then when things go wrong and I say, Lord, I need help. He said, sure. You are mine and it's my responsibility to fix it. Because he's the owner. He's the master and I'm simply the slave. And so that was one thing about in the Middle East, the master 
always took care of his slaves. That's why that one centurion went and said, Jesus, can you heal my slave? Oh, he loved him. I want to make sure he gets healed. I take care of him. Why? Because I own him. Yeah, we didn't, we're not supporting slavery. It's wrong. But in the sense that we become a slave to Christ, then we experience the true freedom. See, some people say, I don't like that submitting to Christ's ownership. I'm just going to get more busy doing some religious things. And some religious things are good to do. But just getting busy doing religious things without submitting to the ownership of Christ is like a hamster on a wheel. So I'm going to get a little faster. Oh, I got to get faster. I don't care how fast you go. You're not going anywhere. You just stay right where you are and the wheel spins faster, but you don't go anywhere. You need somebody with the key to get you out of that wheel, get you out of that cage, and set you free. Amen. Why? And how you do that? Say, Lord, either I've never submitted to your ownership in salvation, or I have before and I've taken some stuff back. See, some people are so bound by their past. So, Brother Tim, I've been doing this so long. This is really who I am. And I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. Brother Tim, I, when I get a little more Bible information, when I get a little more maturity, when I get some of these things worked out in my life, then I believe that I can probably get the Lord to do some things in my life to help me. There was a man, and I closed with this, that was going down the street with his friends one day, a painter, portrait maker. And as he walked down the street, he saw this homeless man that was pathetically looking, drab and stinky, matted beard and hair. I mean, just dirt everywhere. You could smell him around the corner. His clothes were ragged and torn and filthy. And the man realized, you know what? I'm getting ready to make a portrait of the prodigal son. And so he walks up to this homeless man and he said, listen. And he handed him his card. He said, here's my address. He said, if you'll be at my house in two days at 10 o'clock, he said, I want to paint your portrait and I'll give you $200 if you'll let me, uh, if you'll stand for that portrait. So he gave, gives it to him and goes on his way. Well, one day he hears this knock on the door and he opens it up and there standing at the door is this man, clean, shaved, nice clothes, cleaned up, combed hair, brushed teeth, I mean, man said, I'm here for my appointment. He said, I don't have an appointment with you. And he's about to close the door. And he said, no, no. And he stops the door from being slammed. He said, no, no, no. You don't realize you told me to come here. I have an appointment. You said you wanted to paint my portrait. You gave me your card and here it is. And the man took the card from him and looked at the man and said, you're of no use to me now. I wanted you just the way you were. That's the grace of God. We come to Christ just the way we are. And He fixes us up. He changes us. He does the work in us. Yes, we have some fixing up to do, but He does it in us. So we come to Him by grace and say, Lord, in this area, you got the key. All I have to do is come to you and surrender to your Lordship and be obedient to you, and I know you'll do the fixing up and you'll make me free in these areas that has so long kept me from being all that I, I know I need to be and I just go a little faster on that hamster wheel and I'm still the same as I was last year but Lord after looking at this verse two things ought to happen to us one if you're out there and you have to say in your heart you know what if I have to be honest before me and God, I can say there's never been a point in my life where I've surrendered ownership, complete ownership to Christ in salvation. That I've come to Him and asked Him to be my Lord and Savior, to forgive me of all my sin, and I turned over slave ship, ownership to Him. The Bible says you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your bodies. If that's never happened to you, 
then you need to relinquish lordship and ownership to Christ today for the very first time. And you can experience freedom like you've never experienced in your entire life. And be free. And not have to worry about what's going to happen when I die. Am I going to heaven or hell? And all those things that keep us in bondage and bound up to say, what would happen if I drew my last breath? That's bondage. But when you come to know Christ and the forgiveness of sin, you're free. Whew. All the sins are taken away. I'm a new person in Christ and I'm going to heaven without a doubt. If you've never experienced that freedom, then this morning, don't hesitate. You don't know if you've got another breath or another day. You need to settle that issue because if you can't honestly say there was a time that I gave Christ my entire life and surrendered it to him, then you need to do that today. Some who know the Lord, you've done that. But there's some areas you either never gave completely up or you've taken back. Some area that you're not willing to be changed in and this morning you're willing to say, Lord, I, this area, I need, to, I need to just surrender totally. I've had either the wrong influences, I've not gone far enough away from the captors, but I want to change. I want to be all that you've called me to be and it seems like this one thing or these two things or these three things seem like they keep me from obedience because we're the slave to the one that we obey. Some others say, you know what? What I need are those good influences and I need to find a church home. I know the Lord, but I need to be around other people who can help me, encourage me, influence me in the right way so that I can walk in freedom and in liberty. And if that's your situation, then you come as well and we'll gladly receive you into the fellowship. Others say, you know what, I'm just dealing with some issues, some hardships, some difficulties. That I just, I'm about to give up in and I just need the Lord's strength. I need to turn over the key for just extra strength. Lord, I've just let this thing, whatever this burden is, just keep me in bondage. It's just the burden that I'm walking through. And Lord, I want to walk in liberty and walk in freedom. And I want to surrender that to you because you're my owner and you'll take care of everything. Because if we're acting like he's not owner, that he can't take care of it, we've taken back the ownership because we feel like we can take care of it. If the Lord owns me, then he can take care of everything I have in my life and I can trust him with all things. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet,